This is Tim Sheehy. Welcome to Tim Said Podcast. This is Tim Sheehy and the Tim Said Podcast. Today, I'm excited to say my book, Mudslingers, a true story of aerial firefighting, just got delivered. The first hard copy versions. I'm proud of it. Uh, 100% of the proceeds from this book go to benefit the aerial firefighting community. Most of them will go to fallen aerial firefighters' families. Uh, you know, as an example, in the military, if you're killed, wounded in action, your family gets an immediate insurance policy payout and lots of benefits associated with that. If you're a government employee fighting fires, uh, there's a similar structure, uh, not as good as the military will be the first to say, but in place to take care of you and your family. If you're a civilian aerial firefighting pilot, unfortunately, that's not the case. And if you're injured or, or killed in the line of duty, you are serving your country, you're serving your community. A lot of times there's not a whole lot of assistance available for those families immediately. So the Montana Firefighter Fund, the Wildland Firefighter Foundation are two organizations uh, that exist out there to immediately help the families of wildland firefighters, both ground and air, in the immediate aftermath of a family catastrophe. Uh, also, some proceeds will go to the United Aerial Firefighters Association. It's the first association that's been formed by all the aerial firefighting companies to advocate for safer standardization, uh, higher standards of technology with their aircraft, uh, more consistent contracting uh, language. So those organizations benefit from Mudslingers. Check those links below to learn about those organizations and benefit them. What this book talks about is the history of aerial firefighting in North America. It's a fascinating story. I didn't know anything about aerial firefighting when I got into it. I started our company in 2014 after I got out of the military. I got injured as a SEAL, had been a pilot since I was a kid, and wanted to form a company that took the aerial surveillance capability and close air support model that was really life-saving for me and my teams overseas and apply it to, to tasks outside of, of, of war. Although Wildland Fire wasn't at the top of that list, we ended up getting into that industry kind of by accident, and I immediately fell in love with it. Loved the mission, uh, loved the people. As I learned more about it, I realized the history of it was just fascinating, and, and no one had necessarily put it on paper in a consolidated way. And we had so many colorful characters um, you know, throughout American aerial firefighting and Canadian aerial firefighting that just had amazing stories to tell. I felt like someone had to tell it. In the summer of 2021, I had a lot of flight duty that year. COVID was still going on. Air crews moving around were tough. It was a big fire year. So I was in the field a lot flying our super scoopers. There's time where you're sitting waiting to launch. So I just started to write and I started to talk to people, started to talk to other pilots, other operators, base managers, and just reading and realized that you know, as I was just writing this history down, just ad lib as it came out, uh, there was a pretty cool story here. And that's when I decided by the end of that summer, I was going to try to take some of that and put it into a book, not for myself, not to make money, uh, but really because I wanted to share that story with more Americans. So few Americans really understand the sacrifices made to protect them uh, in the wildland fire realm. They don't realize that the apparatus that exists to protect them if their farm or ranch is, is burning, if they're caught camping or fishing up in the mountains and this wildfire raging their way, if their home is in a wildfire prone area, there are hundreds and thousands of people that are highly trained and, and highly equipped to be ready to protect you and your land. The ground aspect of this has been told a little bit more, uh, the aerial aspect and, and the lineage of that uh, is pretty amazing, especially when you start going back to the early days and seeing some of the aircraft coming out of World War II, the Korean War, how they were converted for fire, and the individuals that did it, you know, some of these swashbuckling early barnstorming pilots, pretty impressive to learn about that and see what they were doing. Our friends in Canada made a great trip up to the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and the, and the Canadian Bush Plain Museum up there in Sault Ste. Marie, and you see some of the early firefighting planes, the spotting planes, the early tankers that they used in the scoopers. Uh, it, it's just an amazing story, and and I feel privileged to be a part of the community. And when I wrote this book, it's not my story. It's not uh, a story that belongs to me, which is why I'm donating the proceeds to, to the community, because it really is a story about the community. Unfortunately, I can't tell every bit of history. I can't tell every single person's story. I wish I could, but our book would be too long, and I don't think anybody would read it. So uh, we tried to get the, the high points of the industry, of its history, and condense it into a digestible format. Uh, obviously, my story is a bit woven in just because I did write it. And it's a first-person perspective. I think that that adds a little bit of through thread to the story. A couple of key excerpts from this that I want to make sure I talk about. So you'll see in some of these, you know, I've got historical photos uh, that were generously lent to me 
um, by the Canadian Bush Plain Heritage Center up in Ontario in Sault Ste. Marie. And they show some of the early uh, aerial firefighting aircraft that they innovated. Literally, float planes with metal cylinders with a top cut out of them, and you'd pull a cord from the cockpit, and they'd just roll sideways, called roll tanks. And that didn't last a, a super long time, but you know how they started out doing that's pretty cool. And then you start looking at some of the spotter planes in the 1920s that, that were flying all through the forests in Canada and using those float planes, because all the lakes up there, they didn't even have runways. So basing everything out of the water with some of the lineage of today's more modern uh, seaplanes and float planes, of which there are not many. The float plane and seaplane industry kind of faded a long time ago. But uh, but seeing that uh, is pretty powerful. And then, of course, taking us all the way up to today where we have, you know, very advanced, you know, full-on airline aircraft like the DC-10, which is, you know, the largest aero firefighting plane in the world right now, which is just a beast. And that thing can lay down, you know, a line of retardant, 10,000 gallons of it, and literally can can box in a whole fire in a couple of drops if it has to. So seeing how far the industry's come, but most importantly, recognizing uh, a, a lot of the sacrifices that happened early in the industry of people innovating, uh, you know, barnstorming, designing things on the fly. Sometimes, obviously, it didn't work out. A lot of crashes, a lot of structural failures as the industry started to understand, you know, really how to engineer the, those products to be safe and effective uh, over the target. So we talk about that, talk about some of the uh, hotbeds of innovation. Of course, you had um, Hemet, California, Grass Valley, California, Ontario, uh, Sault Ste. Marie up in Ontario, Canada. You know, those are kind of some of the hotbeds of, of early innovation in, in North American aerial firefighting. Uh, some side stories there as well. We talked about some of the aviation missions that were related to aerial firefighting, like the missionaries in the 50s and 60s. There was a lot of a blending of, of missions and, and some of our early bush plane pioneers that were very important aero firefighting were also missionary pilots in South America flying some of the similar aircraft that we used here, uh, you know, taking taking missionaries down to very, very remote airstrips and operating in, in austere conditions. Didn't talk much about Europe, uh, although Europe's got a very robust and heroic aero firefighting uh, capability as well. This book's just focused on, on primarily the U.S. and Canadian uh, firefighting stories and, and how those came to be. It's really cool to see the book in hard copy. You know, I've been writing it in my free time for years now. I hope uh, I hope folks buy it, not because I'm going to get the money, but it'll support the aero firefighting community. But most importantly, I want to get the story of aero firefighters out there. It's the community story, and I hope people enjoy it. The book is available for pre-order at Barnes & Noble and Amazon.com. will be available on December 12th. If it isn't in your lo local bookstore, make sure to ask for it. Mudslingers, a true story of aerial firefighting. You'll see the subtitle, An American Origin Story. I love this country. I'm a proud American. We've had some amazing innovations come out of America. We've had some amazing stories that this country has been the birthplace for, and this is one of those. I have a couple other book ideas I'm also writing, and those will fall into the same category of amazing historical inventions, whether they be economic evolutions, whether they be technological advancements, whether they be industries like this that America has given birth to that have changed the world. And I can try to tell those stories under the banner of the American origin stories. 